Hello, loyalists, and happy uh, glorious 12th. Uh, anyway, this is going to be an explanatory video about the 12th of July for those who are not among i conoscenti. Um, anyway, so the 12th of July is celebrated by loyalists in Northern Ireland and other places. Now, what, what does a loyalist mean? As in somebody who's loyal to the British monarchy, but um, it's, it's really only for Protestants. You can be a Catholic Unionist. I don't think you can be a Catholic uh, loyalist. Now, um, most people in the UK are vaguely monarchists, but they don't make a song or a dance about it. But those who call themselves loyalists, they really do emphasise this point. It's important to their identity. So um, why the 12th of July? Well, it marks the Battle of the Boyne, which was fought in 1690. Now, the Battle of Boyne was actually fought on the 1st of July, because back then the British Isles used to go by the Julian calendar. Now, the Catholic world under Pope Gregory had updated to the to the Gregorian calendar in a previous century. But because it was after the Reformation, um, uh, the British Isles stuck with the Julian calendar. Only in 1752 did the British Isles adopt the Gregorian calendar and jump forward um, those 11 days. And when that was done, um, some people were very worried, thinking they were going to lose 11 days off their life. But, uh, but they weren't. So although the... The, the Battle of the Boyne is actually fought on the 1st of July. It's marked on the 12th of July. Um, so people, sometimes people just call it the Glorious 12th. Um, I don't want to go too much into the background, to the background, but uh, the Battle of Boyne, well, the Boyne is a river in Ireland that um, d divides County Louth from County Meath. It uh, bisects the town of Drogheda, and it's actually very close to the Hill of Tara, which was an ancient capital of Ireland um, in pre-Norman times, Go back to the earliest Celtic era, that those burial tombs at New Grange, where I think on midsummer morning the a shaft of light will come up at dawn and ignite this burial chamber, not ignite, sorry, illuminate this burial chamber. It just so happens the battle was fought there. It's not why the battle was fought there. The boy is actually not that not that wide at that point. And so the Battle of Boyne was only fought a few miles inland, like about seven miles inland. Anyway, um, so in 1688, James II had been overthrown. He was king of England, king of Ireland, king of Scots, um, and he was a Catholic, whereas in um, England, Scotland, Wales, the great majority of people were Protestants. In Ireland, most of us were Catholics. We had a small Protestant community, mostly in Dublin and then the northeast. So Ireland is divided into four provinces, Munster, Leinster, Connacht and Ulster. The Catholics were, were a high majority in three of those provinces. The uh, Protestants these days are maybe half the population of Ulster. Ulster is the northern province. But um, uh, we've also got counties in Ireland. We've got 32. Ulster's got nine of those. Six of the nine are in Northern Ireland. Three of the nine are on the Republic of Ireland. If you're complicated, if you're confused because it's complicated, well, I don't blame you. But anyway, um, Protestants are a minor minority in only about four of those six counties. Would have, would have been more in the past. But um, anyway, James II, having been ousted in England, were really fled before there was much of a fight. Um, went to France, who's good friends with Louis XIV, King of France, France being a very Catholic country. Louis XIV had started severely discriminated against his Protestant minority, the Huguenots, but uh, he's keen to help um, James II regain his, th regain his throne. And James II was overthrown mainly because he was a Catholic. Could you have a Catholic monarch ruling a Protestant people? Well, many Protestants said you could not. I um, mean, he, he had, he'd um, had two daughters uh, with his first wife, Anne Hyde. She died. He married Mary of Modena, this Italian noblewoman, and then a child was born to them. But uh, people said it was a supposititious infant, smuggled it in a warming pan, claimed it was a changeling. They hadn't had a baby at all, which is nonsensical because the birth was witnessed by dozens of people. Now, it's true that quite a few of those courtiers who witnessed it were Catholics, but that doesn't mean that they were lying about that. Um, anyhow. So there's an invitation to William, the Immortal Seven, both Whigs and Tories, MPs, peers, and the Bishop of London, Compton, writing to William the Stadtholder of the Netherlands, asking him to come to come and do various things to maintain their, their civil and religious liberties and to investigate the claim that uh, James II's son was not, in fact, his son. So um, now uh, William the Stadtholder of the Netherlands, his son is called William of Orange because his surname was Orange Nassau. Orange because Orange, the town in France on La Côte d'Azur, and Nassau because of the town in Germany where some of his ancestors had come from. So he was not president of the Netherlands, or king or prime minister, Stadtholder, as in state holder, effectively ruler of the Netherlands. It was an elected position, but as he was the fourth dynast, 
his family had also been elected to it for over, over a century. He was also the um, son-in-law of James II, so he married to James II's eldest daughter, Mary, and he was also the nephew of James II, his mother being James II's sister. Okay, so you got that. William III married his first cousin. William III and William of Orange are the same person, by the way. So um, he landed at Torbay in England. There's a song about it landing at Torbay on um, uh, the 5th of November, um, 1688. And some people said, ah, well, 5th of November, remember, remember the 5th of November, Gunpowder Treat and Plot. It was, it was a date of happy augury, redolent of 1605. That was good news for Protestantism. It was a century since the defeat of the Spanish Armada, not to the day. And people said a Protestant wind had blown him there. Uh, it was touch and go where the English Navy would oppose him. Remember, there have been three Anglo-Dutch wars not long before, uh, but they didn't, the English Navy in the end. And, uh, oh yeah, and there's a song about it saying, "'Twas his natal day." It wasn't William III's natal day. It was one day off his birthday, but it was so close that the um, lyricist couldn't couldn't uh, resist um, stretching the truth um, to make it more auspicious. So the... Um, there was um, a brief battle outside, what's that, Basingstoke, and most of, of uh, James II's generals had deserted, including Sir John Churchill, ancestor of Winston Churchill. This lot had fought against the Duke of Monmouth's rebellion three years earlier. But uh, anyway, so that's when James II fled, and so William III and then his wife Mary came to London. So what was the Parliament of England Wales to do? Um because they didn't want to overthrow the monarch, but they they deemed that he'd abdicated. James II didn't actually say he was abdicating, but by running away, they said, well, he's renounced the throne. And are they going to say his daughter Mary is, is Queen Regnant now, or his um, son-in-law and nephew William III is, is king now? No, they said it would be joint sovereigns. Um, so um, then, um, as I say, James II went to Ireland, where he felt he was assured of support from the Catholic majority, and that was true. Now, it doesn't suit nationalists to remember this, what is a nationalist? That is someone who believes that Ireland, or at least most of it, should be independent, or at least mostly. When I say independent, of course, we're not independent because we're part of the European Union, but not united with uh, with with Great Britain anyhow. Um, and that didn't exist because, of course, the Act of Union didn't exist. And uh, nobody seemed to question that we should have a monarch, and that monarch should be the same person as the King of England um, uh, at that time. So nationalism, as we know it, only got you know, going in the 1790s. Um so, yes, many people rallied to his banner. Um, and so William III landed the very north of Ireland with a Protestant majority, feeling that um, most of them would, would back his cause. And indeed, that was correct. Now, the Protestant community in Ireland was mostly people of English, Scots, Welsh and Manx descent who'd arrived a generation or two earlier. Um, and so they, did, they didn't throw their lot in with him. They didn't regard themselves as Irish at the time, um, that lot, who were the recent immigrants. Um, uh, anyway, so there were also old English people, so-called people, the old English come over from England, um, in the, in the 12th century, although they're mostly Catholics, even though English speaking. So a lot of people forget this now in Ireland for over 500 years, we had a large community on the Eastern littoral that was English speaking, um, and didn't regard themselves as, as, as Irish and nobody, and they weren't called Irish by, you know, native Irish people as, as they, who actually spoke Irish. So there are fault lines in Irish society of language and religious denomination. So cut a long story short, William III advanced to the Boyne. He fought the battle there. He had a significant num numerical advantage, about 36,000 troops against 25,000. He had some Dutch troops on his side. He had some black Dutch troops on his side. Now, he wasn't anti-Catholic. He'd had plenty of Catholic um, subordinates. He had the Blue Guards, an exclusively Catholic regiment. So Godot de Ginkle fought on his side, and so did... Um, uh, the Duke of Schomberg. And Schomberg was his number two, was killed at the battle. And anyway, um, they the, the, the Boyne was quite low. The Boyne is somewhat tidal. I think it was tidal at that point. He got his men to wade through, holding their rifles above their heads to keep their powder dry, um, managing to um, force a bridge further to the west. And um, James II wasn't very committed to it. He's being pushed back. William III had an asthma attack. He didn't ride a white horse. He rode a brown a brown steed. The white horse was introduced a bit later on because the Hanoverian succession after 1714, the white horse being a symbol of the Hanoverians. But maybe there's also a whole this knight and the white horse thing that uh, was uh, misattributed to him. Anyway, so although things were going badly for, for James II, um, the fight was not over. He could have fought on. It might, it might have turned the tide, but he threw in the towel too early and he just retreated. He called it a day when there was still some chance of victory, 
On the other hand, his men retreated in good order. It wasn't a complete rout. He got to Dublin. He still controlled most of Ireland. He could have fought on, but no, he took ship to France, sought refuge with his good chum, um, Louis XIV. Now, he'd earlier signed the Treaty of Dover, saying he would reintroduce Catholicism as the state religion as soon as the security of his, of his crown permitted. Well, that never permitted, because when there was even the merest rumour of it leaked out, he was overthrown, because there was a lot of vicious anti-Catholicism in Great Britain at the time. Okay, in fairness, in, in, in Catholic countries, a lot of anti-Protestantism too. Um, so one of the really one of the really um, heartening things in my lifetime is the decline in sectarianism. We don't really particularly care about who's Protestant or who's Catholic anymore. There's very little animus anymore, whereas in my childhood, there's quite a lot of that in Northern Ireland. I know from the, Repub the Republic. Um, anyhow, so... Um, then um, James, some people called James II, James the shit for leaving us in the lurch. The fighting wasn't over, went on for a further two years. There were several battles between Ochram and Eskillen. Um, there was the siege of Limerick. Um, I've talked about that in another video. So uh, they got to Cork. Anyway, James III's men, uh, so James II's men, well, had mostly, mostly fled the country. William III was victorious and um, he'd vowed no discrimination against the Catholic majority and he really wasn't sectarian himself. Unfortunately, the new Parliament of Ireland was exclusively Protestant and said, no, we're in charge now, we're going to discriminate. And the main thing this 1688 revolution is about, or some people call it glorious revolution, that's a value judgment, so I avoid that, is they say that the supremacy of Parliament, the Bill of Rights was, packed, was passed as well. So so um, with a heavy heart, he did sign it, and that soured relations. Now, it's fun to play counterfactual history. Supposing James II had won... And we had a Catholic monarch in Ireland. Would he have got Great Britain back? I think not. He wouldn't have managed it. But So we could have been a separate kingdom at that point. Or indeed, if we somehow had got Britain back, Great Britain back as well, we would have been Catholic. We had a Catholic monarch. Would Great Britain have turned back to Catholicism? I don't think so. But we wouldn't have this objection, oh, they're, Cat they're, they're Protestants who discriminated against us and our Protestant minority in Ireland. We might have had equality with them. Maybe they would, have, they would have been discriminated against. But perhaps, well, the Act of Union, would that have happened? That's an imponderable. If it had happened, it would have been broken. I mean, so many things could have um, severed the chain of causation over the century. So it's very difficult to conjecture what would have transpired had um, uh, uh, James II repelled the invader. So... Um, after his death, the Orange Order was founded. Now, in the 1790s, there were a number of organizations uh, with the word Orange in the name of the Orange Boys. And there have been some clubs called about the Orange and the Blue and so on, because of William of Orange, that's why his color. And that was color was very associated with the Netherlands. Some people saw it as, as liberty because the Netherlands was a relatively free country. You know, Catholics and Jews were not that discriminated against there and um, had a wider franchise, some sort of parliamentary government, probably more extensive than in Great Britain back then. Uh, anyway, so the 1790s was a time of uh, great sectarian tension. The country was in turmoil shortly after the French Revolution. And there's a lot of uh, agrarian terrorism, people going around and attacking unpopular landlords or those who'd started to rent the farms that tenants had been booted off and docking the, 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 the tales of cattle, stealing cattle, you know, um, slaughtering cattle and things like that, burning down each other's houses. A lot of secret oath-bound societies running out around at night White boys, Peepo Day boys, Steel boys, things like that, Oak boys. And because they were clandestine organizations, not a lot is known about them. They sworn to secret oaths and um, people were occasionally caught. Information came out at trials. How much can we believe that? And so a lot of sectarian fighting, particularly in the north. So the Orange Order, was it founded by, uh, by, by Dan Winter? Was it founded by, I think, Tom Wilson? The different theories. There was some clash at Loch Gaul in County Armagh in 1795. That's generally taken to be the foundation of the Orange Order. Dan Winter's cottage is there. And was it for Church of Ireland people only, or no, was it a Presbyterian thing initially? Um, but anyway, after a while, Protestants of all denominations were permitted to join. Remember, the 17, in 1790s, Protestant usually meant Church of Ireland only. If you were, the other, There were dissenters who were... Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Quakers, Protestants outside the Church of Ireland were called dissenters in those days because they dissented from the church as by law established. Of course, in Ireland, like at least 70 percent of us were Catholics. But in, in the southern counties, it was a much higher majority than 70 percent who were Catholic. So um, and um, the Orange Order actually wasn't in favor of, of, of the Act of Union to begin with because they were there to uphold the monarchy. Right. Not the Act of Union. And the Act of Union was supposed to be accompanied by Catholic emancipation. 
uh, as in uh, terminating uh, anti-Catholic discrimination by law. Um, but that didn't happen. So the Orange Order got going. It changed his mind about the Act of Union. It started to embrace it with fervor and with relish. Um, and um, there are sometimes some rival or Orange Order organizations. It was a largely working class and lower middle class organization to begin with. It was briefly banned in the 17, so in the 1820s. And then eventually the aristocracy came in and co-opted it um, and became maybe quite respectable. So it's it's divided into districts and each district has a number of lodges to it and their various titles like Worshipful Master, Grand Master. They borrow a lot of their um, nomencl nomenclature and imagery from the Freemasons who have become popular in the 18th century, like the Ladders and so on, and uh, the word Lodge. So having their meetings and then the 12th of July is their big day for, for celebration, for parading, marching around in, in orange sashes or orange collarettes, to be more accurate. And they got this song, it was old, but it was beautiful, and the colours, they were fine. It had been seen at Ochram, Enniskillen and the Boyne. Um, uh, something something about bygone days of war, yore, and it's on the 12th, I love to wear the sash my father wore. So um, it, there's that tune. Da -da 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 Okay, played with jubilance on the on the glorious twelfth. Uh, so um, the Orange Order had a charitable aspect to it. Is that some of the lots of friendly societies, um, and the society, the, the the charities were largely each other, helping each other out, help you get a job. You're unemployed. You're sick. We've all contributed money. We'll look after you. There was no health care. There was no welfare benefits in those days. Caring for someone who was um, injured, for widows and orphans of the lodge, things like that, and then parading. And as I say, the upper class joined. And remember, it's a very socially stratified time. But just because you're upper class, you didn't automatically get to be the worshipful master or something. And so it was a bit of a thrill for a working class person to sometimes be higher up the pecking order in the orange order than the upper class was. But by the late 19th century, most of the top jobs were usually held by upper class people. Um, so... Um, Anyway, in the, from the mid to the late 19th century, there were regular, there were clashes about the, the Orange Marches sometimes, some Catholics objecting to it. The Orange Order spread throughout Ireland. Initially, we'd just been at Armagh. Some of them wanted to drive all the Catholics out of Armagh in, in the 1790s, spread to the whole of Ulster, eventually the whole of Ireland, obviously heavily concentrated in the northeast, and it's all over Great Britain. There are Orange, orange Orders today in the United States, um, Canada, Togo. They're somewhere in the Maldives. There's an Orange Lodge. I can't think where else they are. Um, there's a lodge from, from, from Canada comes to parade in Belfast. They wear their Native American feather bonnets. Um, obviously the, the, there's a, a, the Dublin Orangeman. Fowler Hall was there, was there. HQ, the IRA took over in 1922 because they wanted to kind of get back the loyalists. Well, we're not sequester a building from someone who's a Catholic. And, um, but Fowler Hall has been renamed something or else. I can't remember the name of the, even the square. And there were orange marches in the south, I mean, into 1936. A lot of orange men going to get a train for the 12th of July to go up to the north from Dublin were attacked about 1936. The last orange march in the south, apart from Rosnola, County Donegal, which is just over the border. And apparently there's some sort of orange lodge in Cork, but it lies completely underground. It doesn't have a building. They wouldn't show their faces. So the orange order has got a bad reputation in the Republic of Ireland amongst nationalists. Uh, I say bad, I mean, a generation ago, it was appalling. They're thought to be um, absolutely monstrous bigots and fire-breathing anti-Catholics. Now, I've met many Orangemen. I know they're not all like that. I've observed many Orange marches. So, um, anyway, the uh, so Catholics tend to have a negative attitude to the Orange Order, and quite a few Orange more anti-Catholic. Also, Orange women as well. So they mainly the marching season, late June into July, obviously the best weather, somewhat through the rest of July and into August. Now, there's the Royal Black Preceptory, which is a similar organisation. Um, there's the Royal Purple Arch, another similar one. These are the loyal orders. Then there's the Apprentice Boys of Derry, which is a bit different, which is specifically about the Siege of Derry. I shan't talk about that, though. That was sort of 1688, the Siege of Derry. Um, and uh, you can only join that if you're actually in Derry. And all of these organisations are Protestants only. If you can convert from... from uh, Catholicism, you can join. Now, although, um, as the Orange Order used to say, born Protestants only, there was one Catholic in Scotland in the late 19th century. He converted to Protestantism, and he was he got work, rose to be head of the um, Orange Order in Scotland. So most of the Orangemen in Scotland are of Northern Ireland, Northern Irish descent. The Faithful Tribe is a magnificent history of the Orange Order, um, a highly sympathetic one penned by Ruth Dudley Edwards, whom I've met, a very distinguished uh, historian and novelist who comes from a um, Catholic nationalist background in Dublin, 
but is very broad-minded and challenged some of these uh, most cherished nationalist shibboleths, often expose them for the um, bunkum that they are. Um, so um, anyway, there are obviously orange men in the Republic of Ireland to suggest they're not uh, anti-Catholic considering with a very high Catholic majority, like sort of like 95 percent not so long ago. So the, the Irish government gave six million euros to the Grand Lodge of Ireland to pay for repairs to orange, orange halls in the south of Ireland, often they've been vandalised. Well, I thought that was a very um, generous, spirited gesture, and obviously showing liberality at a time of straightened economic circumstances. Um, extraordinary that we, we gave them such largesse. Um, okay, so uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, and the, the, remember 1921, that truce took effect on the 11th of July, and I won, uh, presumably, in 1921, the 12th of July, Orangemen would have discussed it avidly at their meetings. So the thing is, the Orange Order, they're about the Battle of the Boyne, and that gave us liberty and so on. Um, but, you know, if you're a Catholic or and a nationalist, why should you object? Because, well, um, there was no nationalism in 1688, and it doesn't suit nationalists to realise that, thinking that the, the, there was a replay of the current uh, current dispute, and it's not, actually. Um, because um, everybody was a monarchist in Ireland, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or what, whatever in the 17th century, just to who should be the monarch. And the King of Ireland should be the same person as the King of England. That was like, that went without without dispute at the time. It just was taken as read. Um, anyway, you can be Catholic and, 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 and uh, Unionist, of course. So um, the, anti, uh, the Orange Order is certainly anti-nationalist. It supports the British monarchy being Protestant. Supposing the monarchs were to convert to Catholicism, it would no longer support them. Um, so they're pro-Protestant, but some people are anti-Catholic as well. Um, so anyway, they want to, they, they don't automatically want to maintain the union. It didn't actually say that. But for many of them, I think maintaining the union and being for the British monarchy are more or less the same thing. So uh, anyway, that's, um, I, I think James II was good because he wanted to bring back religious equality, brought in the act of indulgence, the act of toleration. No discrimination against Episcopalians in Scotland or Protestant or sort of Catholics in England. In England, Wales, Catholics promoted to high offices in the army. In Ireland, the Lord Deputy and the head of the Irish Army, both Catholic under him for the first time in quite a few years. Obadiah Walker, a Catholic becoming the head of University College Oxford, my old college, um, and so there was a big dispute in my college. Two different factions, some of them accepting Obadiah Walker, others not, and they had keys to different parts of the college and locking each other out. Um, anyway, so that Treaty of Dover, which I mentioned, that was uh, Louis XIV secretly funding James II. So he wouldn't have to call Parliament, because remember, he could only tax with the agreement of Parliament. His, his father, Charles I, had got into trouble for not doing so um, and trying to bring, bring back Catholicism as soon as he could. You know, because there was this perfervid anti-Catholic hysteria because of the popish plot, as in um, Titus Oates, this guy who, who was uh, brought up a Protestant, supposedly for, for, for Catholicism, went to a Catholic seminary in, in, in France, but as a spy, it was a double agent coming back, telling the English government, oh, these bloodthirsty fiends, the Catholics, they're planning to slaughter us all, and accusing um, all and sundry of Catholic plotting. And indeed, Oliver Plunkett, the Archbishop of Armagh, brought to London, tried for high treason, then executed. That's why he's be been beatified since Blessed Oliver Plunkett Street in Ireland. And I think his head is in a church in Drogheda, just a few miles away from, from um, where the Battle of Buenos fought. Drogheda, incidentally, it's um, meaning bridge, Drogheda in the Irish language. If you ever see the, the, the I think it's called the Thor Thornbirds, this American-Australian soap opera, whether someone's pronouncing Drogheda, who's obviously read it but doesn't have no idea how to pronounce it, did a double take when he said Drogheda. What? Oh, he's talking about Drogheda because it's got a silent G in it. Um, anyway, it's a pity that we didn't have religious equality back then. There were Catholics and Protestants on both sides. It's not as straightforward as people want. It's part of a wider European conflict, the War of the League of Augsburg, as in Augsburg, Bavaria, was signed. And then it, it would discombobulate some loyalists to know that when um, the Pope heard that um, uh, William III had won, he ordered Te Deum to be sung in the Vatican, as in, to you, O God, that hymn Te Deum, that's what it means. Um, because he bizarrely wanted the Catholic James II to be defeated, because even though James II and his ally, Louis XIV, were Catholics, they were clashing with the Pope. I know it seems bizarre, but Catholic monarchs weren't necessarily on the side of the Pope, and the Pope was very much a political ruler at the time, not just a spiritual leader, and had his own army and his pontifical navy, and was a serious force, so got down and dirty into all sorts of political disputes like any other monarch. So a Jacobite is the one who's an adherent of uh, James II, 
Jacobite cause continued until 1746 at least, but that's another story. So, I mean, nationalism reveals, it has to realize if, if that um, nationalism didn't exist in the 17th century, and that reveals that nationalism is not as old as some people like to think. So, um, the nationalism was not about breaking the connection with Great Britain, or indeed remaking the connection with Great Britain. Um, anyway, so James II was the rightful king, so and most of us were for, for him. So, in the real sense of loyalist, Catholics, most of us were more loyal than most Protestants at that time. So people ought to be less emotional and more objective. There, there are orange parades all over Northern Ireland, and there used to be more, and it weren't very controversial at the 70s. Then nationalists and Republicans began to object. The IRA issuing death threats, burning down Orange Hall, the Orange Halls, killing quite a few Orangemen. Now, um, almost every um, law, uh, unionist politician was in the Orange Order. The Prime Ministers of Northern Ireland, you know, Ter Terence O'Neill, for example, parading in their orange robes. There was also the independent orange order, a slightly different one, which loyal fundraised for loyalist terrorists. And it was, it was, it's, you know, disturbing to see that there have been some, some former loyalist terrorists who are allowed into the orange order. The orange order say, we'll never speak to terrorists except loyalist ones, or having, um, sometimes commemorating loyalist terrorists, some appalling um, uh, psychopathic killers just killing Catholic civilians. So, um, Anyway, the Orange Order say we voluntarily rerouted lots of Orange marches, allow us to do this. Fortunately, these things largely pass off peacefully. I remember as recently as the late 90s, there was just ritual rioting, fighting about it, trying to block things, certain contentious routes like the Ormore Road, wanting to reroute them. And the Orange Order said, we're already very generous spirited. We voluntarily do this a lot, but no, you can't push us too far. Otherwise, I have nothing left like that um, parade, um, the Drum Cree Church, that uh, Church of Ireland church. I can't remember the name of the church. I've be, actually been to it just outside Portadown. It was um, uh, very controversial in the late 90s. I won't tell you the whole story of that. Um, anyway, so that's just a little bit about um, the uh, 12th of July. There are parades in Glasgow, for example. Occasionally they're in England, but largely the parade's not going ahead this year because of, um, because of coronavirus. So some people from Northern Ireland just like to get out of the place around, around the marching season because there used to be a lot of trouble. Plus, it's getting into holidays. School holidays started just before it for that reason, earlier than in England and Wales, about the same time as in Scotland. Um, I've been to the Orange Parades in, 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 in Liverpool. And um, you should read The Catholic Orangeman of Togo by Craig Murray, this former British diplomat, and saying he couldn't believe it. There were Catholics in the Orange Order in, in, in Togo, West Africa, the sort of cargo cult notion of Britishness, who honestly didn't realise the Orange Order is meant to be only for Protestants and is anti-Catholicism. Often say we're not anti-Catholic, we're not against the people, but we do disagree with the beliefs, saying they're fatal errors of the Church of Rome and that the qualifications of an Orangeman to refrain from uncharitable references to your Roman Catholic brethren, as in Catholics. We tend not to call ourselves Roman Catholics. We're not Italian, as uh, Sean O'Callaghan wrote in, in um, the, 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 uh, the Informer, his book about being an Informer inside the IRA, um, or saying papers a bit antiquated, possibly pejorative. Um, and Orangemen are not supposed to go to any, any Catholic worship because that would be that would be countenancing with your presence. Like David Trimble of the Oma bomb went to a funeral of Bun Crana of a Catholic child who was killed, and there were moves to boot him out of the Orange Order. I don't know if that actually happened. And some said you couldn't be married to a Catholic either in it. So there were some nasty pieces of work in the Orange Order in, in the old days. Anyway, that's just a little bit about um, um, the, the Orange Order and the 12th of July. Toodaloo.